Paul Edwards is at his mother's house when the text comes into his phone. It's November 5th, 2009. His mom's just a half mile from his small efficiency apartment in the sprawling suburban city of Miramar, Florida. The text is from Paul's girlfriend of many years. He and 35-year-old Lisa Spence met long ago in the Caribbean island of Trinidad, just off the northern coast of South America. Paul persuaded Lisa to move to Florida so they could be together. And in the years since, they've had their ups and downs. Lately, it's been a lot of downs. Lisa's text to him this Thursday seems simple enough, if cryptic. It says, just wait till I got better. But it's not so much what her message says that's stunning. It's that he got a text from her at all. Lisa Spence had vanished a month ago after returning home from a night shift at work. Nobody has seen her since. And now, from out of the blue, she's texting Paul Edwards. From the South Florida Sun Sentinel in association with Wondery, this is Felonious Florida, the podcast that leads you into the dark side of the Sunshine State. I'm your host, Emma Kate Austin, along with reporter Juan Ortega. And this is part one of the disappearance of Lisa Spence. Bella Beauty Supply sits in the middle of a tiny strip mall that's typical of so many others around Florida. It's painted stark white with a flat, low roof. On one side is a quick stop convenience store. On the other side is a chiropractor's office, a tiny hair salon, and a shop offering psychic readings. The entire strip mall has enough parking spots for no more than 30 cars. Small airplanes buzz overhead, landing and taking off from tiny North Perry Airport directly across the street. A large neon open sign hangs on Bella's double doors. Its two windows are covered with posters of smiling women modeling hair weaves and hairsprays. Lisa Rhonda Spence works there when the manager needs her, often on Fridays and Saturdays. She also works at the quick stop next door, where she's a cashier. That's where she is on the night of October 7, 2009, on a four-hour shift. She works hard, holding both jobs to support her family from afar, especially her 17-year-old daughter and 13-year-old son. She hopes to save enough money to someday move them from Trinidad to Florida. She dreams of the three of them living together in America. On that Wednesday night, she takes a break from her shift at the quick stop to call her daughter in Trinidad, 1,600 miles away. Serlene is just a few days from her 18th birthday. Lisa's at work, so she can't talk for long. She promises she'll call Serlene back later. By 11 that night, she hasn't. So Serlene calls her back, and she calls, and she calls. No answer from her mom. She tries again the next morning, and again, no answer. It's unusual behavior for Lisa Spence. Something must be wrong. Lisa is scheduled to work a shift at the strip mall that morning, but she doesn't show up. Her coworkers and her boss don't even get a call from her. Lisa's a responsible employee and has many people in her life who matter to her. Family, kids, friends who love her. Days pass and none of them sees Lisa. She's vanished. It took a few days for word to reach Lisa's sister-in-law in Philadelphia. Avril Absalom is falling asleep late Saturday night when a relative calls from Trinidad to say Lisa is nowhere to be found. Avril gets some sleep, but as soon as she wakes up in the morning, her mind races about where Lisa could be. I said, that's, that's, that's strange. And anyhow, I think I fell asleep because I was wiped out. And the Sunday morning, I got up and I called Trinidad again. I said, did you just tell me this? And she said, yes. And then I said, okay, I'm coming off the phone. And then I called. Of course, I didn't know. I mean, I don't know anymore, Florida. Avril decides to call the police. So I just called the area that I thought she was. And so anyhow, I was bounced around with like two or three police, three things, and then I finally got to the right spot. She tries several different numbers before she reaches an officer, and it's a lucky break. Avril explains the situation, another missing person to any other cop, but not to the officer on the other end of the line. This officer is a regular customer at the quick stop. He knows Lisa. It was just amazing because I got there, and I spoke to an officer, and, and he says, I'm describing... I'm got a, a name, and I see where I think she lives. And then he says, oh, I know her. And I said, are you kidding me? And he said, yes, I go into that store all the time. I know her. I know exactly what you're talking about. The quick stop is popular with other police officers, too. So when they hear about Lisa's disappearance, they start an investigation. Lisa Spence is officially a missing person. Officer Mark D'Angelo has been on the force for three years. He's one of the quick stop regulars. The store was in his assigned patrol area, so he stopped by often enough that he knows all the employees there. He stopped in as usual on the Saturday after Lisa had gone missing. The cashier that night told him that Lisa hadn't been seen in days and that everybody in the store was worried about her. 
More officers got involved, and over the next few days, five of them were asking around and checking on the places where Lisa could have been. Mark St. Fort was another of them. He's 36 and had been with the Miramar police for seven years. On a Thursday night, several days after Lisa was last seen, he took an audio recorder to the strip mall where Lisa worked. The Quick Stop and Bella Beauty Supply are owned by the same family, and the manager is a man named Mohammed Awad. He's Lisa's boss. Officer St. Fort interviewed Mohammed just after midnight. Okay, in reference to your employee, Lisa, um, when was the last time you saw her? Uh, actually, she is not employee. She's not yet. an official, official yeah. employee, yeah. but she's here all the time. Uh, she she helped us, yeah, what, what we need her, like, uh, for our... Okay, how many times how many times a week does she help you out? Uh, it depends on my situation here. Okay. Uh, like, the last day she worked here, she come around, uh, she start uh, six. Okay, four hours. Yeah, four hours. Okay. Mohammed tells Officer St. Fort that it's unlike Lisa to not show up at work without calling him first. Okay, so it's definitely, definitely suspicious that no one has heard from her or seen her. No. She doesn't have any other family down here that you know of here in, in Florida? Here in Florida, no. And I'm ready for any help. But before the interview is over, Mohammed gives Officer St. Fort some odd information and a possible trail to follow. A friend who's often in the quick stop told Mohammed that he got a text from Lisa's phone the day after she failed to show up for work. His name is Richard Moore. He was a regular at the store and met Lisa at least a year earlier there. The 63-year-old became friends with her, almost a fatherly figure. This is Officer St. Fort's recording of his interview with Richard about Lisa's disappearance and her text. When was the last time you physically seen her? I seen her Wednesday. I stayed with her because I stayed with the girls to help them. The guy owns the store is a friend of mine. So when the girls are there late, I stay with them, you know. And uh, I stayed with her till it was like 7.35 on Wednesday. I said, at least I'm going to go because the other guy come in, so I'm going to go home and get some rest. I give her a big old hug. She said, I'll see you tomorrow. So the next day, <coughs> Muhammad or somebody said, did Lisa call? I said, no, no. She said, we didn't show up for work. I said, well, that's strange because she was in a good mood, you know, and everything, you know. So I called. I, I said, Lisa, I'm worried about you. Give me a call. Now I think that was about 4 o'clock, I believe. I'm not real sure on the time. So nothing. Then, then about... 5 o'clock or 5.30, a text message come in. I got two. The message not on your phone anymore? No, nah, I erased the darn thing. I didn't think I'll know it. You know, I don't... Every day I go out and clear my messages, and you know, the next morning I start over. But there was something there. Like, I've been trying to think what the word was. And then she said, as soon as I get settled in, I'll give you a call. And then blank. I mean, nothing. I, I've tried to leave a message. I left her a couple messages after that. It, for a while, the phone would take messages. And I said, at least I'm worried about you. Please give me a call. You know I love you. I even sent her a little clip art. You know, that's what we get it. Right. I sent that to her. Nothing, nothing. So I, well, I don't know how many messages I left her to call me. And then after a while, nothing. If Lisa Spence had disappeared, how and why was she sending text messages to Richard Moore? And is there anybody else getting them? Felonious Florida is brought to you by Simply Safe Home Security. Simply Safe is a fantastic security system providing great protection for your home. But before Simply Safe, home security companies were getting away with a lot. They were overcharging for outdated, complicated systems and trapping people in pricey contracts. That changed 10 years ago when an electrical engineer named Chad Lawrence had a few friends who were burglarized. They wanted security, but there weren't any good options. So Chad started Simply Safe. He got rid of the hidden fees and contracts. He made Simply Safe intuitive and easy to use. He just wanted a security company that treated people right. Now, Simply Safe is the top choice security system of CNET, PCMag, and Wirecutter. But most importantly, over 2 million people trust it to keep them safe all because Chad wanted to help his friends who were burglarized. Go to simplysafe.com slash Florida to get yours today. That's simplysafe.com slash Florida. Lisa Spence grew up just outside the small city of Arima in Trinidad. A census estimate puts population there at about 30,000. English is the official language. Tradition has endured on this island. Generations live close to one another, sometimes even in the same house. Trinidad is one of the most distant Caribbean islands, but is still a popular destination for the huge cruise ships that sail out of Florida. The ships dock in a downtown that features skyscrapers, bustling arcade malls, a financial center, and patients testing rush hour traffic. But Arima is in the middle of the island, far from the tourist and business centers. Some families still live in basic wooden huts. Most of the homes there are small buildings, two or three stories. They're painted with bright Caribbean colors, usually with clay tiles for roofs. Lisa was raised there, a middle child with five brothers and sisters. They all lived in a house with their mom and dad. Some of the kids had to share the same bed. Growing up, Lisa enjoyed going to the beach, and she loved being with her mom and her family. Just like other families on the island, hers was very tight-knit. As soon as she finished high school, she went right to work to earn money. By the 1990s, Lisa was living in a housing development a few minutes outside of Arima. 
She's five foot six, brown eyes, long black hair. She had her daughter Serlene when she was young, just 17. Serlene's father was Avril Absalom's brother. Lisa met Avril for the first time around 1994. I'm Lisa's daughter, Serlene. Um, it's my niece. Um, it, she's my brother's daughter. Yes, yeah, so my brother and and um, Lisa were together um, for a long time. I was really looking forward to meeting her um, because my niece, was, she was so gorgeous, such a pretty baby. Um, and I knew of, of my brother's relationship with her. And um, again, you know, when I met her, she, she was very warm, very nice. I thought, I thought she was a very nice girl. But Lisa's relationship with Avril's brother eventually ended. A relationship with another man led to Lisa's son, five years after Serlene. It was sometime many years later when Lisa met the man who would eventually lead her to Florida. Lisa met Paul Edwards in Trinidad, though it's not clear exactly when. Paul had three kids from prior relationships with two other women. He was a corrections officer who worked in Trinidad's prison system. Some described him as friendly and courteous. He was eight years older than Lisa. Lisa and Paul grew closer and eventually moved into an apartment together, along with Lisa's daughter and son. They lived happily at first, but their relationship started getting more tense over the years. Paul and Lisa had started to fight often. The fights would sometimes get physical. She lived with him in Trinidad. You know, he abused her there. And like with all abused women, you know, he would come back and he'd apologize and he would say, never do this again. Um, he would bring gifts and then she would go right back with him. And so that happened for quite a while. The couple would break up, then get back together. It happened several times. But finally, their rocky relationship reached an end. They split up and their lives went down different paths. Lisa landed a well-paying job and was supporting her kids. Paul reunited with the mother of two of his children, and the two packed up and moved from Trinidad to Florida in 2003. The couple's reunion, however, would be short-lived. Despite moving to the U.S. together, Paul and the other woman argued and split up just six months later. Soon, Paul turned his attention back to Lisa. He wanted to try again. This time would be different. He started calling Lisa from Florida and urged her to come join him. There are so many opportunities, he'd tell her. She'd be happy here. One day, Lisa finally agreed. She packed her bags, left her kids in the care of her mother and other family, and headed to the Sunshine State. She came up to Florida for like a mini visit um, one year, and then the next year, she fully moved to Florida. Um, but she, um, I think, made the decision, should she stay in front of that, or should she come, you know, to, to somehow, um, you know, make a better life for her children? When she came up here, um, she was promised, you know, as far as I know, many things. Um, you know, you would move to America, um, you can work, your children could come live with you. And I, I, it seems to me that that's what she was promised. And she came and she made the decision to leave. She suddenly had a good job in Trinidad and she earned, you know, a decent salary down there. But, um, you know, she was encouraged to come up here um, just so she would have a better life for her kids. I think that was, that was also part of the promise, you know, the package of, you know, um, that Paul gave to her that if she, if she would come to America, her kids would eventually be able to join her. They would get married. Um, and then everything will be taken care of. So that's what she was hoping for. Once in Florida, Lisa moved into Paul's apartment in Miramar. It was in a multifamily building on Venetian Street. Apartment B was a tiny unit. You walk into the front door and straight into the living room. The small kitchen is just footsteps away. There's a closet along a hallway, which leads to the only bedroom and bathroom. You can walk around the entire place in seconds. It didn't matter. Lisa and Paul didn't get many visitors. The apartment is right behind the strip mall where Lisa would soon land work at the Quick Stop and Beauty Supply Store. It took her less than a minute to walk to the shops. It was important to her to earn her own money. Um, and she, you know, she didn't mind working hard for it, extra hours and things like that. Lisa and Paul lived out their daily lives in that little apartment. It's where they were living the day Lisa vanished. Police officers knocked on the door of apartment B shortly after Lisa went missing. Paul was home and let them in. Danny Smith has been on the Miramar Police Force since 1997. He began doing road patrol when he joined the department, but moved up to working homicide investigations within a few years. At the time that Paul Edwards was letting officers into his apartment, Detective Smith hadn't yet been assigned to the investigation. It's just a missing persons case. Well, it actually went to uh, our missing persons unit initially. There was the, the welfare check that was called in, and uh, two of our missing persons detectives uh, went to her residence. Obviously, that's the first place you're going to check, knock on the door, and then make contact with Paul Edwards. It didn't take long for officers to see problems with Paul's story. Things weren't adding up. They returned two days later with more questions. He keeps telling police that Lisa broke up with him and moved out. I spoke with Paul. They got a weird vibe from him. Uh, they got with us. When I say us, I mean the homicide unit and said, hey, this is what we have. What do you guys think? And as soon as we heard the story and, and uh, I guess some of his odd behavior, um, some of his odd answers to questions uh, that he gave to the missing persons detectives, we immediately took it over. Both times, Paul let the officers inspect the apartment. 
They checked to see if Lisa left any belongings behind, or maybe a forwarding address. Any clue that could reveal where she went. I think a lot of it was intuition. Um, there was a, a couple of his his answers to where she is was, uh, I don't know. Um, we She broke up with me and she, she just picked up and left. Really, do you know where she went? Um, you know, how did she get her stuff out of here? She doesn't have a car. Uh, and he, his answers were, I have no idea. She just got up and left. Lisa never needed a car in Florida. Work was right around the corner. He was uh, slightly nervous, um, which is by any by itself is it is what it is. You know, people are nervous talking with uh, the police. But Paul's behavior and his statements were making police suspicious. Maybe this was more than a simple disappearance. So homicide detective Smith took over the investigation. It's about a week after Lisa vanished and Detective Smith and other investigators decide they need more answers from Paul Edwards. They find him at his mother's home, just a mile and a half from his apartment. He agrees to go back to the police station for questioning. It's there police notice Paul has some injuries that they want him to explain. They take photographs of a cut on his left forearm, and another on the inside of his right pinky finger. We actually call him in, we bring him in, and immediately red flags come up. He has cuts on his hands that look like... Um, they are maybe a couple, uh, a couple days old. They're not completely scabbed over. However, you could tell that they're recent. Paul has an explanation for the cuts, but it only raises more questions. He tells police that he and Lisa have argued and fought in the past. About a week before she disappeared, Lisa threatened him with a knife, he says. He was protecting himself and was cut when he tried to grab the knife away from Lisa. And he says they fought again the night Lisa had last been seen. He tells us a story that they got in an argument and they... That she decides to leave. According to Paul, Lisa told him that she was breaking up with him and leaving that night. He said he decided to give her some time to gather her belongings. He left the apartment and drove around his neighborhood for an hour in a rental car. But by the time he returned home, Lisa was gone. So were her things. He has no idea how she moved it. She, she doesn't have a vehicle. And we thought that was kind of odd because if someone's going to leave for the rest of their lives, they're probably going to call somebody and ask for some help, help moving. And at the same time, it's probably going to take a little bit more than an hour. Paul tells Detective Smith he hasn't seen or heard from Lisa since. Police are dubious of Paul's story, and they're starting to piece together a dark picture of his relationship with Lisa. Paul admitted to them they had fought, and that their fights had been physical. And as they talk to other people in Lisa's life, the picture becomes more clear. As, our, as we started working our, our investigation, Lisa's close friends were coming forward and saying that he, he's been abusive physically, verbally, and um, they know of this information. However, it was, it, it was never told to the police. Her friends had many stories about violence. Lisa's friend from the quick stop, Richard Moore, was one of them. Richard was friends with the store's owner and was there a lot. He liked helping out the workers. They even gave him a nickname, Daddy. He's not sure where Daddy came from, but it stuck. He told Officer St. Fort that Paul was abusive and that Lisa was trying to find a way out of the relationship. Well, she was very unhappy with the guy she's living with. You know his name? Paul. Okay. And on here, I guess, a couple months. At time, I'm not good at time, but he was slapping her around. And then, you know, she kept telling me she got to get out of this mess and stuff. And she was asking my opinion, you know, and I told her, look, once they start that, they never stop. And Richard wasn't the only person to describe Lisa's situation in the weeks leading up to her disappearance. Another person recounted a past incident that was more chilling. There was one friend in particular that uh, Lisa called and uh, met with him one time. He lives in the area. She had said that she was sleeping and woke up to Paul standing over her and he had a telephone cord wrapped around her throat. And he wasn't really putting a whole lot of pressure, but enough to where it woke her up. And uh, he, she, Lisa didn't know why Paul was upset, uh, but she did know that she woke up to a cord around her neck, and he made it clear to her that she needs to do what he says, or else he's going to use this cord on her. By October of 2009, Lisa had had enough of the abuse. She planned to end it with Paul. She was going to leave, she told friends, but she just needed the right time. She wanted to leave when Paul wasn't around. She said she had her one little bag packed that she going to take off the first chance she got. But it was difficult to find the right time. Paul kept calling in sick from work. So he was home a lot, and she didn't want to try to leave while he was there. And when Paul wasn't working, he was coming into the quick stop more often, likely to check on Lisa. Richard Moore recalled seeing him. He kept coming to the store early in the morning and started drinking. I never noticed him drink before, but he started drinking. What time? Like, how early? Oh, I mean, you know, like in the morning hours. Like, you know, say 9, 10, you know, I call that early, but, you know, for drinking. Right. Was Lisa afraid of Paul? That key question comes up while Lisa's boss, Mohammed, is describing Paul and Lisa to police. So did she ever describe, well, she never told you that she was in fear of him or scared? She was scared of him. She told you. She told you that? Yeah. But there was something else going on in Lisa's life that police were about to discover. There was another man. Hi, this is Emma Kate Austin. Audiobooks motivate us, inspire us, even bring us closer together. And there's no better place to listen than Audible. Audible has the largest selection of audiobooks on the planet. 
And now, with Audible Originals, the selection has gotten even more custom with content made just for members. Every month, Audible members get one credit for any audiobook they choose, plus two Audible Originals from a changing selection that they can't get anywhere else. You're listening to our show because you love true crime. Audible has a new book you might like straight out of Florida. Bob Brink's Murder in Palm Beach is the story of a shocking 1976 murder that made headlines for 15 years. And Audible has James Patterson's brand new book, Ambush. Now Audible has a special offer for listeners of Felonious Florida. Get your first audiobook free and choose two titles from a curated list of Audible originals when you try Audible for 30 days. Just visit audible.com slash Florida or text Florida to 500-500. With Audible, your books are yours to keep. Go back and re-listen anytime, even if you cancel your membership. Don't like your audiobook? Exchange it. No questions asked. So get your free audiobook today by going to audible.com slash Florida. That's A-U-D-I-B-L-E dot com slash Florida. Or by texting Florida to 500-500. Audible. You can do it with audiobooks. Lisa Spence had a secret she was keeping from most people. A man had started visiting the store in recent months before she disappeared. His name was Shaquille Lopez, and he and Lisa became friends. That friendship became romantic. Shaquille lived less than a mile from the quick stop, in a three-bedroom house east of the North Perry Airport, in the city of Pembroke Pines. The home doubled as an assisted living facility, and Shaquille split his time between working there and at another business, installing iron fire escape windows. The quick stop wasn't far away from his house, so Shaquille sometimes shopped there. That's where he likely met Lisa. Shaquille said he and Lisa had been dating for about three weeks before she disappeared. Few people knew about the relationship. Richard Moore knew, though. He ran into Shaquille one day and confronted him. She told me she you know, met this guy, and I met him, but I don't know his name. And you know, I told him, I said, you know, you better take care of her because she's a good girl. You hurt her, I'm going to hurt you. Right, so I was tired the, the, the new guy. The new guy, because I was tired of seeing her beat around, you know, because she's a very beautiful person. Not only was Lisa carrying on a secret relationship with Shaquille behind Paul's back, but police learned something else. Richard said he saw Shaquille in the quick stop the night that Lisa disappeared. Paul told police that Lisa said she was going to leave him that night. Was she planning to run away with him? Officer St. Fort asked Richard Moore if that was a possibility. She was pretty happy because he he was even, her boyfriend, a new boyfriend, was even in that day. I don't know what time he was in there, but I want to say like, maybe around seven, maybe a little earlier, but he was in. But did he discuss... Any plans, or did you? Oh, I didn't get it. You know, they go talk. I don't get in their business. You know, she just. Did she tell you she had any plans, or? Yeah, she told me she was leaving, and she was going with that guy. She told you that night. Been telling me, you know, right along for the last couple weeks, you know. But did she tell you once night? It's a night I'm leaving, or? No, no, she didn't tell me night at night. When investigators found Shaquille, he admitted that he and Lisa were involved, very involved. He said the two were planning to start a new life together. They even talked about getting married. Police needed to know more about their secret relationship and the details about the night Lisa vanished. Where was he that night? Shaquille tells them he talked to Lisa on the phone at 10.40. He was at a Jamaican restaurant a few miles from home with a friend named Omar. Omar drove them around town after leaving the restaurant and eventually took Shaquille home. He got there around 11 and was there for the rest of the night. He told police that he hadn't run away with Lisa. Although Shaquille Lopez had claimed that he didn't help Lisa to leave Paul Edwards that night, he did tell police that she had wanted to leave. Shaquille said that Lisa told him Paul was abusing her. And that Wednesday night she would, once and for all, leave him. Shaquille said he was afraid for her safety if she returned to the apartment and had to confront Paul. Don't go back at all, he warned. Leave your belongings and just go. But Lisa insisted that she needed her things, especially her passport. So she went home. When Lisa went missing, Shaquille tried reaching her on her cell phone for days. Richard Moore recalls Shaquille and Lisa's boss, Muhammad Awad, showing up at his home. Both of them were worried about Lisa. I didn't even know they planned on getting married until I spoke to him the night night after she was supposed to call him. He was worried sick, too. He came here with Muhammad to the house. I said, I said nothing. And I, I had a text message at that time. I said, this is all I know about it, you know. So I tried calling her right then. And right then, they, you know, Muhammad and everybody said, well, maybe we've got to call the police. I said, well, you know, I don't think they're going to do anything because she's an adult on the first day. I don't, you know, I, I said, I don't think the, the police officers will do anything on the first day. Her being an adult, I said, if it was a kid, it might be a different story. But I said, something's wrong. So she was in such a good mood Wednesday night, you know. Richard had begun to think back on the text message he got from Lisa's phone the day after she disappeared. Something seemed off about it. For one thing, it was the first time she had ever texted him. She preferred talking on the phone to sending texts. Muhammad Awad agreed. Maybe it wasn't even Lisa who was sending the text. It turned out Richard wasn't the only one who had started getting mysterious texts from Lisa's phone. Dexter Vincent was another. He's Lisa's brother. Dexter moved to the U.S. years before Lisa did, back in the 1990s. He's the second oldest of the six siblings. Lisa is the third, right after him. He was living in Philadelphia in 2009. Dexter and Lisa spoke over the phone a lot, sometimes every day. 
Dexter had been leaving voicemails for his sister since she vanished on October 7th. She never called back. Instead, he started getting a string of texts from Lisa's phone. Some were so long that they were broken up into several texts. And they weren't making much sense. The first came to Dexter's phone at 5.54 p.m. on October 9th, two days after Lisa disappeared. I am trying to text you. I am not getting good reception where I am. I moved two nights ago. I am trying to settle in. Text me back. I am all right. The words were riddled with spelling errors. Then, at 6.10 p.m., another text came in. This one seemed to reference Paul. It said she, quote, truly realized that he really has good intentions, but so much has happened. He left the apartment and wished me the best. An hour and 20 minutes later, another text about Paul. Yes, sir, I am all right, at least for now. I am sad because I will miss Paul. With all that happened, he still was good to me in the end. More texts tell Dexter not to worry about her and ask for his help in reassuring her family. A text at 8.33 that night says, Call Mummy or Serlene for me. Serlene is trying to get on to me when I answer call cut off. Tell them I will call them or text them. The next night, October 10th, more texts come in. 7.53 p.m. What's up? I am just trying to readjust myself. Text Serlene and told her to tell Mummy I moved. I will text when I come out of the shower. 9 p.m. I am in Jacksonville. I don't really know place. I will be in Miami next week. I took a rest from D-Job. Here's reporter Juan Ortega explaining how Lisa's brother handled the texts. He's seeing these text messages that are coming supposedly from Lisa. And it seems pretty early on that he gets onto the idea that it's not Lisa. It just seems so strange for them to be from Lisa. And he decides to try to outsmart this person because if, if it's not Lisa, then who is it? And he, the best he comes up with, he thinks back to how maybe he should ask something that no one else would know except for Lisa. And he thinks back to their childhood when they were growing up in Trinidad. He remembers how Lisa had childhood friends. And one of the childhood friends who lived nearby was a girl named Allison. And Allison had several siblings. So the question that he decides to present to this person on the other end, he asks, what is the name of Allison's brother? And he makes it even more specific. He says, not just any sibling, he wants to know the name of Allison's younger brother. And to him, it seems like this works because the person on the other end of the line who'd, who'd been sending all these text messages all this time suddenly doesn't write back. So he sees this as validation that it's not Lisa. Fed up, Dexter called Paul and confronted him over the phone. What happened to Lisa? He demanded. Paul responded, it wasn't supposed to be like this. And he started to cry. Dexter had enough and hung up the phone. To Dexter, the text didn't sound like Lisa. And police weren't buying it either. One of the texts that Dexter had gotten from his sister's phone was at 9 a.m. on October 10th. She said she was in Jacksonville. But records showed that her cell phone was being read by a tower in Sunny Isles near Miami. That's 300 miles away from Jacksonville. There were also mysterious phone calls. The last known call that Lisa was on happened October 7th. But there were three outbound calls made from Lisa's phone on October 8th and 9th, after she had gone missing. All of them were to Shaquille Lopez, the man Lisa had a secret relationship with. The calls each lasted zero seconds. They were immediate hang-ups. Police dug deeper into phone records, and not just Lisa's. One of the last text messages that Dexter Vincent got from his sister was relayed from a tower in Sunny Isles. The phone records showed that Paul Edwards' phone was also hitting off towers in the same area. In fact, Paul's phone never seemed to be far from Lisa's. There was evidence that Paul Edwards wasn't telling police everything he knew. And then came evidence that something violent had taken place. Officers had already looked around Lisa and Paul's apartment several times, but they wanted a closer look. They returned again, armed with a search warrant, and began a forensic examination of the apartment, CSI style. This time, they discovered small traces of blood. Detective Danny Smith describes how they made the discovery. We searched that residence. We find, um, over the course of the execution of that warrant, we find some blood evidence, not a great deal of blood evidence, but we do find some blood evidence in the bathroom. When you walk into Paul and Lisa's cramped bathroom, the toilet is on the right, just inches from the wooden door. There's a toilet seat with a seafoam green fabric seat cover and a matching bath rug on the white tiled floor. To the back of the toilet is a checkered flower pot with light pink carnations and a bottle of orange hand soap. The bathtub is light blue and there's a green bottle of cucumber melon baby wash in one corner. And wedged between the tub and toilet is the bathroom sink on a deteriorated white vanity cabinet. The formica from the vanity is peeling off, showing the wood underneath. There, on that vanity, spots of blood grab the attention of detectives. And uh, to get technical, under the vanity there was some directionality with that blood. Uh, meaning a normal person would expect that you're going to find some blood in someone's home because people cut themselves. It's, it's normal. But this particular piece of blood evidence had directionality going from down to up underneath the vanity. That's normally not a place that you would bleed if you cut yourself. More traces of blood are found on the bathroom's door frame and on the backsplash tiles in the bathtub. 
investigators collect the blood samples for testing. They need to know, are these drops of blood evidence of a crime? They have the same question about blood found in a vehicle Paul had been driving around the time of Lisa's disappearance. Brenda Harris is Paul Edwards' mother. Because the two lived a half mile apart, Paul was at her place a lot. Brenda knew that Paul and Lisa were having problems. She actually believed they would break up soon. She helped her son out when she could, especially with transportation. Paul didn't have a car of his own. So his mom would sometimes rent vehicles for him. She said Paul's on a do not rent list. He has an, an issue re with returning vehicles on time. So she went and, and rented a car for Paul to do whatever it is that he wanted to do. On the week that Lisa disappeared, she had rented two SUVs for her son. The first was a black Dodge Journey. But Paul returned it right away because the CD player didn't work, he said. So Brenda rented him a white Toyota Highlander, which Paul drove between October 7th and October 13th. It's the car he was driving the night Lisa disappeared. He had been driving around, he said, to give Lisa time to pack her things. It was the Highlander that police tracked down and inspected. They discovered a small amount of blood in the jam of the back left door. So with that, now we're, we're looking at blood evidence. Unfortunately, we don't have an ID on who that is. And we've got to kind of figure out where to go from there. We have a DNA profile, but we don't know what to do with it. Still, they found blood in the couple's apartment and now in a rental SUV. Investigators may not know exactly what to do with the evidence, but they know this. It's going to be crucial when they finally find Lisa. As the investigation into the disappearance of Lisa Spence stretched into weeks, her family in Trinidad was losing hope. When she left for South Florida seeking better work opportunities, she left her kids in the care of her mother and their family. Despite her distance from Trinidad, Lisa remained devoted to her family. She worked hard to earn money to support them. She wanted to do everything she could. She loved her family, um, and certainly she missed them. Some of the money she made was spent flying her daughter and son to Florida to spend summers with her. And she spent a lot of it to stay in touch. She would buy long-distance calling cards. Her calls to Trinidad would sometimes cost $10 a day. She did this every day. You know, and, and she um, really adored her children and her mom especially. Detective Danny Smith reached out to Lisa's daughter, Serlene, early in his investigation. He reached her on her 18th birthday. She wasn't celebrating. She was worried about her mom 1,600 miles away in Florida. From the day that she went missing until the time that police were contacted, her daughter turned 18 years old. Lisa would never miss speaking with her daughter on her 18th birthday. She never phoned. So that right there told us that there, there may be an issue. Lisa did more than stay in touch. She sent money every month. And she would save items that could be valuable to her family. Anything she could ship. She was using a large 55-gallon barrel and packed it with the things she saved. She'd keep adding more until it was full. Then she'd ship it off. The barrel was made of brown, heavy cardboard, waterproof with metal caps on each end. She kept it tucked away in her living room. While police in Miramar are searching for Lisa, there's a barrel just like the one she'd been using four miles away in an empty field in the city of Miami Gardens. It's near a canal, laying day after day in the scorching Florida sunshine. Stuffed inside the barrel, is the headless body of Lisa Spence. On the next episode of Felonious Florida, The Disappearance of Lisa Spence, where are the texts from Lisa's cell phone coming from? Police don't think it's her and start to zero in on the man they believe is behind her disappearance but they don't have enough evidence and resort to a highly unusual tactic. It's a gamble, but it leads them to the grisly discovery near Miami and a break that solves the mystery. Thanks for listening to this episode of Felonious Florida. If you're enjoying the podcast, please rate us on Apple Podcasts and tell your friends about our show. It's available online at feloniousflorida.com, Apple Podcasts, Wondery.com, or wherever you listen to podcasts. You can go online to see photographs, video, and read more about the cases we're featuring at feloniousflorida.com. And be sure to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Polonius Florida is produced by the South Florida Sun Sentinel and Wondery. The Disappearance of Lisa Spence was reported and written by Juan Ortega, and I'm your host and sound designer, Emma Kate Austin. Our producers are David Schutz and Juan Ortega. Editing by Randy Roguski. Sound direction by Sean Pitts. With additional recordings by Carlene Jean and Amy Beth Bennett. The Felonious Florida team includes Lisa Arthur, Dana Banker, Neuron Zoo, Danny Sanchez, and Kelly Fry. Hi, this is Juan Ortega. Local journalism matters. Support us by joining the Sun Sentinel, South Florida's leading source for news, information, and entertainment. Visit sunsentinel.com slash join.